an ever changing world with ever changing lives, Life Changes Network presents a voice of truth and inspiration. This is Life Changes with Filippo, with, un- with the unforgettable, ever insightful conversation that captivates our fascination and insatiability for the inspiring moments of real life journeys. As we, as one, strive for higher planes of existence and a better understanding of ourselves and the world in which we live, always remembering life changes. This is radio like you've never felt before. This is Life Changes with Filippo, with tonight's guest, Gary Zukov, who is a spiritual teacher and author of four consecutive New York Times bestsellers. And now your host, our MC, the master of change, Filippo Voltaggio. Ciao, everyone. And thank you, Mark, for that introduction full of big words. Um, I, I'm i excited to have uh, Gary on our show tonight. We've uh, wanted him for quite some time. He's uh, quite a busy man, and uh, finally he's here. He's here also because uh, he's going to be appearing at the Mastery Conference on Saturday, October the 22nd here in Los Angeles. That's the Reconnective Healing and the Reconnection Mastery Conference of 2011. For more information, do go to thereconnection.com. We'll be talking a little bit more about that later. This is a really great time to have Gary on. Especially since this morning I was reflecting on the little whirlwind tour I had uh, during September. While I was uh, traveling mainly back east, I was singing and doing shows in Connecticut and Long Island. Though they're always special for me, I love the audiences and I love what I do when I'm singing. I love what I do when I'm on radio as well. This trip I decided to, in a sense, dedicate to my mother. Uh, she, she's uh, been alone since my father passed 10 years ago and, and uh, I've invited her to different concerts and events that I've done and she hasn't ventured out. She lives here in California and I, I said to her, this time you, you just have to come. And I just felt like it was really important for her. Little did I know it would be really important for me and for a lot of other people. I, I, I invited my mother to fly out with me to New York and she stayed with some relatives and, um, and, and came to the shows that I did. And I came up with this idea that since I speak about my family a lot during my shows, during the radio shows, during the live events and, and, and the concerts, when I'm singing, etc., and I tell stories about my family, I thought, I- I'm going to introduce my mother to the audiences that I've been singing to all these years about and, and telling stories about my mother. And so I brought my mother on stage just to, to introduce her to the audience. And um, the first show was five or 6,000 people in the audience. And all I did was, was bring her on, and she looked out into the audience, and everybody stood up and gave her a standing ovation. And I got emotional, and she got emotional, and little did I know, but in, afterwards, everybody in the audience, or so many people came up to me and told me how emotional they got because I honored my mother in that way. So the second show, I decided to take it one step further, and I invited my mother up on stage, and this time I sang to her an Italian song about a mother, which is called Mamma, uh, which means mother in Italian, and I sang to her that song. And for the first time, the words of that song really meant something to me more than they had ever meant before. And then the third concert, I did it again, et cetera, et cetera, and people in the audience told me how they were moved by the relationship between my mother and I. And it made me look at and think about the relationship between my mother and I. And at one point, uh, the last couple days before coming back to California, I, I uh, stayed with my mother and her cousins at their home um, as uh, the concerts were all done and we were getting ready to come back. And my mother was serving me making me something to eat in the morning and making me coffee. And, and, and I thought to myself, I removed myself from the normal mother and son relationship in the way that we'd normally been relating. And at the end of this journey trip that we took, um, I was looking at it differently. And I was thinking to myself, if it's true that, that as some people believe, that we have had many different 
kinds of relationships before with specific people in our lives in quote-unquote past lives. And if it's true that we might have relationships of different kind after this lifetime, this particular moment in my life right now, this particular relationship that I am having with this particular being who maybe we've chosen for her to be my mother, me to be her son this time around, might be the only time we do this. And I want to be able to, from here forward, experience the specialness of however this plays out and however beautiful it can play out from this moment on and really um, uh, uh, honor the sacredness of this relationship. And I started to get emotional. And then I started to extrapolate into other significant relationships in my life. I thought about my business partners. I thought about my friends. I thought about my siblings. And I thought how really and truly these people that we think we're working together or we think we're playing together, but we're really relating, we're, or hopefully we're relating, but we're really shaping each other's lives. We're, we, you know, even the audiences. I, I told the audience for the first time ever, I said to them, I love you. You know, in one particular show, I've been doing that particular concert for 14 years in a row. And some of those people in that audience, whether I know it or not, we've been in a relationship for 14 years every year. And I started to see beyond what looks like the audience and me, my mother and me, me and my business partners, me and my friends, like as if there's something else going on. And I'm so glad that Gary is on our show today because I also want to talk to him about that because his books really get to the seat, if you will, of what these relationships may be truly about, maybe have always been about, but we've never thought about them that way. And this is a perfect time for me in my life to be having this conversation with our guest, Gary Zukov, which will be happening right after this. Clean water is not enough. Reverse osmosis, distilled water, and most bottled waters are devoid of naturally occurring minerals. They are acidic, unstructured, and hard to absorb and rob minerals from the body. Ionways ionizers produce a super abundant supply of powerful antioxidants in each glass. Ionized water has a reduced molecular cluster size and a negative charge, hydrating you up to six times better. Water from an Ionways ionizer will help you restore your body to its natural pH balance, boosting your vitality. An ionized water more effectively flushes acidic toxins from within your body. Drink the healthiest water available today. Ionways Water Systems, their water changes everything. To learn more about Ionways Water Systems and how you can own one today, visit our website at lifechangeswithfilippo.com and click on our sponsor page. You are listening to Life Changes with Filippo on the BBS Radio Network with your host, Filippo Voltaggio. You can visit us online via Twitter and Facebook and at lifechangeswithfilippo.com. That's Filippo, F-I-L-I-P-P-O. We're back. I am Filippo, and our guest is Gary Zukov today, who's the author of four consecutive New York Times bestsellers. In 1979, he wrote The Dancing Wu Li Masters, an overview of the new physics, which plumbed in the depths of quantum physics and relativity, winning the American Book Award for Science in 1989. The Seed of the Soul, which is how I came to know Gary many years ago, led the way to seeing the alignment of the personality and the soul as the fulfillment of life and captured the imagination of millions, becoming the number one New York Times, listen to this, bestseller 31 times and remaining on the New York Times bestseller list almost 30 uh, almost three years. In 2000, Gary Zukov wrote Soul Stories, another New York Times bestseller, and then co-authored two more bestsellers with his spiritual partner, Linda Francis. These co-creations, The Heart of the Soul, Emotional Awareness, and The Mind of the Soul, Responsible Choice, were published in 2002 and 2003. Well, now Gary has, uh, reveals a revolutionary new path for spiritual growth in his book, Spiritual Partnership, The Journey to Authentic Power. He outlines the steps 
steps to developing this profound new relationship dynamic which enables and empowers us to reach our full potential and create authentic power and the fulfilling and joyful life that is calling to us all. You, of course, know him from his books and, and, and from his over 30 appearances on the Oprah Winfrey Show. His books have been translated into 24 different languages and have sold over 6 million copies. We are so grateful to have Gary Zukov on the show. Welcome, Gary. Hello, Filippo. It's good to be here. Uh, you know, we actually met at a Conscious Life Expo, and we had a few minutes together, and from that moment I thought, we we need to have this conversation, and um, we haven't been able to connect between your busy schedule and our and our guests, and then now that I've had this experience with my mother and the extrapolation that you heard in the intro, I thought, ah, divine right timing, and here is Gary to help us understand what is going on with this. Well, you're becoming multisensory. And so are millions of other people. And by multi-sensory, I mean you are beginning to um, or are developing a sensory system in addition to the sensory system of your five senses, your ability to see and hear and smell and touch and taste things. And this is happening to so many of us now. Our perception is expanding beyond previous limitations. And we are able to begin to experience things in a different way. And one of the things that we experience in a different way is our relationships with other people. Another thing we experience in a different way is the world. Another thing that we experience in a different way is ourselves. We Mm. begin to experience ourselves as more than bodies and minds, but rather as a personality and a soul at the same time. All of this is the great transformation in consciousness that's happening now. It's an expansion of perceptual capabilities beyond what almost everyone had in the past. And in the future, within a few generations, almost everyone will have. It's an enormous transformation. And your experience of being with your mother and sensing uh, perhaps more of a relationship than this single lifetime with her uh, can explain or plumb the depth of his multi-sensory perception. And it's real. You know, how, how do people know that they are getting into, into that? How, how do they know that they're in, they're in that process? Uh, Oh, there's lots of ways to know. For me, I didn't even know what multi-sensory perception was. The first time I experienced it, and in retrospect, it seemed pretty pretty clear. I was at my grandmother's funeral, and she used to walk me through this large building that she lived when she was old called Twin Oaks in Kansas City. And we'd have dinner in the restaurant, and then we'd walk through the lobby, and it was an ocean of gray hair. And my grandmother was holding me by the hand each time we'd do this, and she'd say, you remember Mrs or you remember Mr. and so-and-so. <laughs> and once I, I I said, but I don't remember him. And she jerked down on my hand and she said, shh, like that. And that was a common thing that she would do when she wanted to quiet me. Hmm. And then uh, she passed on. And she was my favorite grandmother. And I suspect that I might have been her favorite grandchild. And I saw her a lot. I would come back to Kansas City when I was a student at Harvard and and overnight with her there before returning to the small town in Kansas where I uh, came from. And when she passed on, we were I I was in a funeral home, the funeral home, and the rabbi was giving a eulogy for her. And the audience was sitting in a room that was the long part of an L, and there was an alcove just to the rabbi's right. That was the short part of the L. And there was a closed-circuit TV Uh, on the wall for us or on the ceiling for us so that we could see the rabbi as the audience in front of him could see him. Well, this was a long time ago, and closed-circuit TV was novel. And it it so (laughs) seemed strange to me that I could see the rabbi speaking as though I were in the audience, even though I was over here with the family in the alcove, and I started to giggle and then to laugh. Mm. And suddenly my grandmother jerked down on my hand, and she said, shh. She didn't want me disturbing her funeral. Mm. She wanted to enjoy it. So 
I could never miss her because she didn't go anywhere. Mm. And I didn't tell my parents about this for a long time, maybe 20 or 30 years, because I knew in the moment that they would think that I was distraught or uh, it, it was desperate wish fulfillment that my grandmother wasn't gone or that it was a way of masking my pain. But none of those things were happening. I was with Grandma Libby, and I was enjoying her, and uh, she was quieting me so that she could uh, attend her funeral. Mm. So that was my first experience of multisensory perception. But there were more to come, lots more. When I was writing The Dancing Wooly Masters, which was a book about quantum physics and relativity and, and uh, particle physics and Bell's theorem, mm. I had never written a book before, and I'd never been interested in science before, but I'd become very interested in these topics because I'd been invited to be a guest at, the, at, at a Friday afternoon meeting at the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. And so I began to write this book with pure excitement because I wanted to give as a gift to people who would come after me what I was learning from the physicists there who all agreed to help me. And as I was writing this book... After a while, I began to realize that this book was smarter than I was, and it was more comprehensive in its grasp of concepts than I was, and it was funnier than I was. Hmm. <laughs> and I realized that I wasn't writing this book alone. Mm. I, didn't, I, I didn't channel it. It wasn't that easy. It was a lot of fun, but I had to put all of my all of my intelligence and all of my commitment and all of my creativity and all of my love of language into the book. Mm. But afterwards, I realized that it's not possible to be alone. And I, I decided that whatever it was that I was co-creating with, I wanted more of it. Mm. And not only that, I wanted to live my life the way this book was being written, which was spontaneously, intelligently, joyfully. And mm. I've come a distance down that road now. That book was my first experience of authentic power, although I didn't know what that meant at the time. And it, it was it was everything that I saw it would be. That's multi-sensory perception again. I knew when I was writing the book that it would be published. And I knew that it would be received well. And I knew that it would be read by people for a long time. And this was when I was writing about a subject that I had never liked before a book that uh, I had, and I never thought of myself as a writer, or at least mm. not in that sense. But all of those things came to pass. The book was published. It was uh, praised, lavishly praised in the New York Times the, the, the day that it was released. It was uh, picked up by every major book club, and it won the American Book Award for Science, and it's still uh, selling around the world. And that was a long time ago. Hmm, so that indeed. was multi-sensory perception, too. I saw, I won't say what was going to happen. I saw what was going to happen if I did my part. Hmm. All I had to do was keep writing, was to keep creating or co-creating the book. And everything that was, and, and it wasn't as though this was a mystical experience. I saw it, just like I'm seeing the room that I'm sitting in now. And all of those things came to pass. The thing that I didn't, foresee is how well accepted it would be or how successful it would be. Now, these are all experiences of multi-sensory perception. Mm. And when you begin to experience yourself as more than you thought you were, that's multi-sensory perception too. When, when you begin to notice that you know things about other people that you couldn't know and your five senses couldn't tell you. Uh, uh, for example, uh, the common experience of someone calling just when you're thinking of that person. Right. Or you call someone and they say, I was just thinking about you. These are multi-sensory experiences. And we're all, uh, over the next several generations, uh, going to acquire them. And millions of us are acquiring, acquiring them right now. You know, now that you say that, Gary, I'm, I'm thinking how jokingly I've been saying recently uh, stop saying I was just thinking about you uh, and and being surprised about it. Be surprised when I call and you weren't thinking about me. That's the time you should be surprised. <laughs> That's right. When, when as we become multi-sensory, it's the beginning, or actually, for some people, it happens very quickly, 
uh, a, a sense that we're not uh, separate and uh, and that in some way we're connected. But connected is not quite the right word. Uh, how could you say that your arm's connected to your body? It's a part of your body. Mm. And so as we began to sense each other as uh, uh, intimately connected, then, and not only that, long-term neighbors, like, uh, for example, not just a long-term neighbor in a neighborhood, but long-term neighbors in eternity, like you begin to think of your mother. Maybe you've been together in, in other places and other times, in different situations, in different roles, and maybe you will be so again. Well, that's not just um, a whimsical thought. Most of the world's population, I would say well more than half, which means the Buddhist and the Hindu portions, believe or read about or are taught about reincarnation, which is exactly what you're talking about. Mm. I'm not saying that that many of them have experienced it. In fact, I suspect that not a lot of them have. But now that we're becoming multisensory, a whole lot of them are going to including a whole lot of Christians and Jews and atheists and people from all over the world and every culture. You know, Gary, long before I consciously started this journey, you just reminded me of something, uh, and long before I read any of your books or anybody else's on the subject, uh, my my one of my brothers got married and I was his best man and I gave the toast. And out of my mouth came... Uh, since he was older than I, out of my mouth came these words that my brother couldn't wait for me to be born. And we knew we would have a good time and we were looking forward to seeing each other again. And that the audience or the, the guests at the wedding, uh, many of them came up and told me how beautiful that was. I didn't know what I was saying, frankly, or why I was saying it. But for some reason, at that moment, it felt right to say that. And did your brother ever tell you that? No, not no, not at all. Not not that I recall. No. Mm -hmm. That is multisensory perception, very clearly. You knew that, and you shared it. Yeah, and and so it, it seems like the relationship that he have he and I have had growing up is not the normal just two brothers you know who just met each other kind of thing it's as if it's a continuation and that's what i've experienced with some friends uh that it just feels like oh and now we're we're doing this and so i'm really glad we're having this conversation and and you wrote this book and because it it's bringing a whole well obviously a dimension to our relationships exactly that Yes, and, and by the way, I, I want to say to all of our listeners that I don't suggest that you take anything that I say is true simply because I say it or that anybody says as true simply because they say it and also don't take as true anything that anybody writes just because they write it. Instead, see if you resonate with what you hear or what you read. Right. That means if you have a sense of perhaps uh, hearing something or reading something valuable to you. And if you do, then make a note of it, remember it, ponder it, meditate on it. And there's no one in the world that can tell you to do that except you. Creating authentic power is becoming the authority in your own life. And no one is more of an authority on your life than you. Mm. You can begin that now. Gary, I'm glad you said that, actually, because the, I, I believe that there's a time and a, and a place for, for us to to get certain understandings and, and too soon and, and we don't have the foundation by which to, to base all of this. Um, but, but is there such a thing as, as too late? No. No, and there's not such a thing as too soon either. If you look at your experiences, uh, you start to see them carefully, eventually, or maybe quickly, you'll see that every experience that you're in, every situation that you're in, offers you an opportunity to grow spiritually. Now, what I mean by that is to become aware of what you are experiencing inside yourself and to either act in a way that's destructive and habitual or to choose instead in that moment, no matter what's going on inside of you or outside of you, to choose to act constructively 
even if it's a new thing for you to do. In other words, that every interaction in your life and every thought, every experience gives you an opportunity to distinguish within yourself the difference between love and fear and to choose love no matter what you are experiencing, even if it's painful. And, uh, excuse me, did I say choose fear? If I did, I misspoke. To choose love, no matter what you're experiencing, even if it's painful. And if you're feeling fear, it will be painful. So that's the creation of authentic power. Distinguishing love from fear within yourself and always choosing love, which is something that I think everybody in this audience would agree to. The question becomes, how can you do that? Especially how can you do that when you're angry or you're jealous or you're upset or you're worried or you're overwhelmed? That's the practice. That's where emotional awareness to show you whether you're experiencing a part of your personality that's loving or a part of your personality that's frightened. For example, those things I mentioned, anger, jealousy, superiority, inferiority, whether you're acting on any kind of compulsion or addiction, whenever you do that, you're acting on a part of your personality that originates in fear. Mm. And as you develop the ability to recognize them and challenge them by not acting on them, they begin to lose their control over you. And as you do that again and again, their control over you disintegrates. And that's how you create an authentically powerful life. And that's how everything, that's, that's what everything that I do and I do with Linda Francis, my spiritual partner, is about. It's about creating authentic power and spiritual partnerships. That's what we're going to be talking about at the Reconnection at the Mastery Conference in Los Angeles. And uh, I'm not saying, by the way, that I'm a master. But I am saying that I've changed my life from someone who at one time was a Green Beret officer in Vietnam uh, and afterwards was uh, uh, doing uh, experiments with drugs, to put it mildly, uh, was riding motorcycles, was a sex addict, was angry, was jealous, into who I am now, which is very different. Well, that's what I've done, and if I can do that, anyone can do it. And doing that is developing mastery in your life. That's the same as creating authentic power. No, so, Gary, I, I'm sorry to interrupt. I have to ask you a question. Had I known you back then, and had I known what you are sharing with me today, but you didn't at the time, if I said to you, but Gary, you're supposed to, or you would rather uh, know this and be this way, um, would that was it wrong what you were doing or you needed to take that time to go through that process? Do you know what I mean? I think I do. Uh, in answer to your question, if you had told me what I was just sharing with you, none of it, not only would none of it have made sense, I would have dismissed it as nonsense. Because at that time in my life, I was so frightened, I didn't even know how frightened I was. I knew I was frightened to go on equipment jumps at night I knew that I was frightened to go on combat patrols. I knew I was frightened to do many of the things that I did in the military, but I didn't know how frightened I was of trying and failing or how frightened I was of being ridiculed or how frightened I was of not living up to my expectations or the expectations that I thought other people had of me. Mm. And there's a word for that. When you're too frightened to even consider the possibility that you're really frightened, that's macho. And I was macho. Mm. Very much. Very much. So I would have been dismissive. And, uh, uh, and well, by the way, whenever you try to change someone, whenever you try to make someone think the way you want them to think so you'll feel better about yourself, that's the pursuit <laughs> of external power, not authentic <laughs> power. Well, then, then let me ask you this, Gary. So um, we're, we're going to break to a quick commercial here in a second, but I, I, I just have to ask you, if I know an old Gary Zukov in, in my life, if there's somebody that, that had those, that, that, was, that is macho now, and I know this person, do, do I give him one of your books, or do I share him with him or her some of this information, or do I just say they'll get it when it's their time? You see if he's open or not experiment a little bit and if there's an openness then do what's appropriate uh, there's always it, it's the intention that you have when you share with someone when we come back from break I'll give you examples of 
of how much it's possible to influence a person, especially when you have no attachment to the outcome and your Ah. intention comes from love. That sounds key. That sounds key. And actually, and when we do come back from break, I also want to talk about, um, obviously, spiritual partnerships, which we have been talking about. But you mentioned something that I always thought should be included in wedding vows. So we'll talk about that when we come back. We're talking to Gary Zukov here on Life Changes with Filippo, who will be appearing at the U.S. Mastery Conference here in 2011 on Saturday, October the 22nd in Los Angeles. For more information, go to uh, thereconnection.com. You can also go to lifechangeswithfilippo.com and you'll get all the information there as well. We'll be right back with Gary Zukov right after this. There are self-help seminars costing thousands of dollars guaranteeing miraculous transformations. There are compelling speakers and life-changing weekend experiences where you can walk on fire. They all deliver revelations that guarantee you'll come back for the more expensive revelations filled with even greater wonder next month on Fiji. We get addicted to positive, heartfelt, expensive theater. What we really need is a jumpstart, an awakening, someone who can give us a reminder that everything we need lies within. Through inspiration and practical knowledge, Dorothy Donahue helps people get grounded and motivated, inspired and energized. It's not just words and affirmations and the power of intention. It's a mindset brought about by a tangible, transcendental experience, an audiovisual, physical, spiritual experience that helps us realize we transform ourselves. We get tools to become the conscious co-creators of lives of unlimited potential. Find out more. Go to DorothyDonahue.com. You are listening to Life Changes with Filippo on the BBS Radio Network with our host, Filippo Voltaggio. You can hear tonight's show and all our past shows, which include luminaries such as David Wilcock, Mariel Hemingway, Giorgio Sukalos, Marcy Shymoff, and Shadow Stevens on our archive page at our website at lifechangeswithfilippo.com. That's Filippo, F-I-L-I-P-P-O dot com. Remember, you can also connect with us via Twitter and Facebook and now in our own community at LifeChangesNetwork.com where real people come together to share real life in real time. That's LifeChangesNetwork.com. We're back, and I am Filippo Voltaggio, and today our guest is Gary Zukov, who is a legendary. His Well, his books are legendary. He, he's got many more years of sharing wonderful things with us, so I hate to use that word for people, but definitely his books are legendary, and his appearances actually are as well. He's appeared on the Oprah Winfrey Show over 30 times, and he has endeared audiences in the millions uh, from his many books. You, of course, probably remember him from Seed of the Soul. His new book book spiritual partnership is what we're talking about today and gary before the break you said that um you well you remember what you said please share with us <laughs> well, will you go. ask yeah you asked me Filippo, if uh if uh you had told me uh, some of the things about multi-sensory perception and authentic power uh at a time when i was in my 20s and very macho if i had uh you asked me if i would have Uh, heard you or understood them and I said the answer is no but then you said well should you have just you knew such a person and should you just let this person be knowing that at the right time that person would move into where he needs to be that's always the case but if a person is open you will always find the ability to help if a person's not you will never, but you can plant some seeds. Like this happened once to me just after I got out of the Army and I was in Hong Kong. And I had stepped out of a hotel, and uh, I, I was wearing a suit, and I uh, snuffed out my Marlboros. I always smoked them because they made me feel so manly on the sidewalk. <laughs> and I started to walk away when I felt this tap on my shoulder. And I turned around, and there was this small, old Chinese man with a big smile on his face it went ear to ear and he was holding his arm out to me and between his finger his forefinger and his thumb was my cigarette butt he was returning it to me mm. and he was so <laughs> wonderful to look at i without thinking i put my hand out and uh, he put the cigarette butt in my 
the palm of my hand, and he was still smiling so beautifully. Mm. And I thanked him, and I put the cigarette butt in my suit pocket, and I walked away thinking, my goodness, the people in Hong Kong certainly are clean. Well, <laughs> actually, that's not <laughs> my experience of Hong Kong overall, but that's what I felt in that moment. Hmm. Now, years later, 30 or 35 years later, I was in a small town in the mountains where I was living, and I was walking behind two teenagers, and they were walking in front of me, chewing, talking, walking, oblivious to what was around them, and one of them finished his candy bar, and with a swing of his arm behind him, threw the paper uh, wrapping almost at my feet. He didn't hmm. know I was behind him. And a rage flew up in me. And I felt like whirling him around and saying, what are you doing? How dare you do this to my town, to my mm -hmm. sidewalk? Don't you know other people live here? What kind of an animal are you? On and on it went in my head. And then, then I remembered this old man in Hong Kong decades ago. Here I was, a foreigner, mm -hmm. a white person in Hong Kong, befouling his sidewalk, and mm. he didn't do any of that. If he had, we'd have gotten in a huge explosive argument. Instead, he went straight into my heart. He couldn't have done it with just a smile. It was the energy behind that smile that I remember still. Wow. And at that, at that moment, I realized that so long ago, I met a master. He's long left the earth school but he still is alive in me. That's what an intention that comes from love can do. Wow, without, uh, 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 yeah, which is what you started to say before the break, that, that if, if our intention is from love or without expectation or however you said that, and and maybe and, and maybe that's it is maybe we are that moment where they change but if if we try and force it upon them when they're not ready then then that won't happen because we can't change them but if we don't speak if we feel like it's appropriate to speak from love then they might we might they might miss the opportunity to have grown if they were ready well it depends on your intention if your intention is to change someone so that you'll feel better about yourself that will create problems. That's the pursuit of external power. That's understanding power is the ability to manipulate and to control. But yes. I'm talking about power as the alignment of your personality with your soul, using your own awareness and your own will, creating a life in which you are able to bring the energy of your soul and its intentions, harmony, cooperation, sharing, and reverence for life into the earth school. Hmm. Well, G Gary, uh, that is that is really beautiful, and um, I'm certainly taking that away from uh, from this interview with me today. Uh, th there, there's something that I that I see in the book that that you talk about spiritual partners, and ironically, at at first, before getting into it, I, I thought it was going to be kind of like divine compliments or or soulmate kind of thing, but of course, as we've talked about throughout the interview, it, it it's from everything from our mothers to our business partners and friends and and relatives and all that kind of stuff and um uh, but however it, it you you mentioned how spiritual spiritual partners stay together as long as they grow together and i've always thought that that should be in marriage vows that it should say that um that we sh that they'll be together for as long as they both shall grow and 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 here you are not only applying that necessarily to marriage, but also to all kinds of other partnerships. Well, spiritual partnership is new. It's a partnership. Spiritual partnership is a partnership between equals for the purpose of spiritual growth. And this kind of relationship has not existed in the past because we were a five sensory species in the past. Now we're becoming a multi sensory species. And we're beginning to see that we evolve not by just surviving. We evolve by growing spiritually. And that means creating authentic power. Spiritual partners are all or both 
it's not just a couple's di- uh, a dynamic. Spiritual partners are each committed to growing spiritually, to doing their own work of becoming emotionally aware, of making responsible choices, of challenging the parts of their personality that originate in fear, such as anger and jealousy and resentment, and by not acting on them, and cultivating the loving parts of their personality, such as gratitude and appreciations, appreciation and, and uh, patience, by acting on them. They can't change one another, but they can support one another. They're committed to their own spiritual growth, and they're committed to supporting each other. And that doesn't mean teaching or preaching or trying to trying to change each other, but supporting one another in the changes that each is committed to making. That's the new dynamic. And it's got different energy. Um, that's the new relationship, and it's got different dynamics than any relationship in the past, whether it's marriage or friendship or commercial relationships. Spiritual partnership is now infusing every relationship. Marriage is an ancient archetype. It's designed for five sensory humans. It's designed to enhance the probability of survival and, more recently, comfort on the part of the marriage partners. But spiritual partners are not together to assuage each other's fears or to help each other become more um, financially or physically successful. They are there to help one another grow spiritually, and they are each committed to growing spiritually. So if one spiritual partner ceases to grow or to want to grow spiritually, for example, if someone is angry and won't challenge his anger, reaches a place where he says, look, I'm angry, now get off my back, stay off my back, I'm not going to change, I don't want to change, so uh, stop it. Then he's turning his back on spiritual growth. Instead, he's cultivating a frightened part of his personality. Now, that's not a good thing or a bad thing in the sense of most of us think of good and bad. It's a cause, and every cause has effects. So when you choose to act on a frightened part of your personality, you create effects or consequences that are painful and destructive. And that's what he's choosing to do. And if he's choosing not to grow spiritually, then there's no reason for the spiritual partnership. The spiritual partnership is for equals who are both committed to growing spiritually and helping one another. If one of them stops doing that, the reason, the very reason for the partnership disappears and the partnership dissolves. It's an, ener- it's an energy dynamic. It will always happen. And this doesn't mean, by the way, that spiritual partners don't get angry. If one of them has a frightened part of her personality that's angry, she'll get angry a lot because that is an opportunity for her to grow spiritually. Her anger is a spiritual path for her, not a spiritual op- not an obstacle to her spirituality. So her anger will come up a lot. And it may be that she'll get stuck in it now and then. And it may take a day or days before she realizes that she doesn't want to relate to her partners that way, that she loves them. And it's not how she wants to live her life. But if she reaches a place where she will not challenge her anger, then her spiritual partnerships will disintegrate, at least for her. Because she, it, and it, it'll be a natural thing. She'll become less and less interested in her former spiritual partners because they're interested in other things, and they will become less interested in interacting with her. They'll still love her, but the reason for their being together will have disappeared. And that's why spiritual partners stay together as long as they grow together. And when they stop growing together, they move apart. Well, well, you know, Gary, it's interesting. You were reading my mind there for a moment as you were answering the questions that were coming up in my head, and uh, I, I liked that. Thank you. Uh, now, 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 this brings up another question for me, and that is when I when I think of spiritual partners, maybe because of the word spiritual, I've always associated to 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 more joy and and divine right timing and and all that wonderful stuff that. That to to look at it though, when you say that there there could be anger and and fear and all that, and as you grow, when the other partner 
do, no longer wants to participate in a relationship where there is anger and fear, or um, chooses to to learn from fear and hate and and anger, um, th- then they're still growing through fear and hate and anger. It, but it doesn't. It just doesn't feel like spiritual partnership to me. Well, they're not growing through fear and hate and anger. If they're growing, they're growing by challenging their fear, challenging their anger, challenging their hate, which means experiencing it as fully as they can and not acting on it. That's how you create authentic power. That's where the rubber meets the spiritual road. Becoming fully aware in your life, emotionally aware of what you're feeling in terms of physical sensations in your body, for example, in your throat area, in your chest area, in your solar plexus area, and it'll be painful when a frightened part of your personality is active and not acting on it. Seeing the thoughts of a frightened part of your personality, which will be critical or judgmental of others or yourself, and not acting on that frightened part of your personality. So if you have a partner or a friend who is angry, and your friend's anger is activating frightened parts of your personality, you can learn from that experience by challenging your own reactions, not your friend's reactions, but your reactions, because changing you is your job. And you'll find it's the biggest one that you have to do in your life. My Sue uncle once told me, Tonshka, nephew, the longest trip you're going to make is between here, and he put his fingers on his forehead, and here, and he put his fingers on his chest. That's creating authentic power. And there's a way to do it. It involves awareness, and it involves your will. I'm not saying to stay in a toxic or an abusive relationship. That's not healthy, and I don't feel that it's wise. But there's learning in whatever you do. You can't make a bad choice in the earth school. You can make a choice that creates painful, destructive, difficult consequences. And they will provide you opportunities to learn and make new choices. You can also make choices that create blissful, constructive, healthy consequences. And they will also offer you opportunities to learn, to choose again the same thing, to create healthy, constructive wholesome consequences. All roads lead to home. You are not judged. Every moment offers you an opportunity to grow spiritually. And if you can't... See, let let, let me put it this way. You said earlier in the show that uh, uh, you you, you can sense or or feel uh, a, a deep relationship between friends or colleagues or even business uh, associates. But I'm not talking about experiencing the deep interactions that you have with people or or a multisensory perception of past interactions simply with friends and people who feel good, people who are brutal and in your life, or also people that you've been with before, and they are there to assist you in your learning as well. The Dalai Lama says we can learn more from our enemies than we can from our friends, and maybe this is what he's talking about. Your enemies will push your buttons. Your enemies will make you impatient, judgmental, enraged. They'll make you feel superior or inferior. But if you really look at it, they can't do any of those things. It's all an appearance. They can activate, and they do activate, dynamics in you that experience these painful emotions of anger or jealousy or superiority or inferiority. But it's not someone else who's making you feel that way. The someone else is just triggering that dynamic in you. And if you don't address that dynamic in you, it remains intact, no matter how much you try to influence the trigger. And sooner or later, usually sooner, it's going to become active again. Mm. And that will continue throughout your life until you realize that it's you you need to change. It's you that has to become aware and stop acting destructively no matter how magnetically attractive your anger is Mm. or that open bottle of alcohol is or that sexual partner is that you just met. 
and bring mastery into your life by mm. experiencing the frightened parts of your personality that have been out of your control, experiencing them emotionally, among other ways, and then not acting on them, and instead reaching for the healthiest, most wholesome and grounded part of your personality that you can in the moment and acting from that. Wow. 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 Well, thank you for acting on whatever you acted on to write these books and this book in particular, whose uh, time has certainly come for this new kind of relationship. And this conversation has been perfect timing for me in my life, and I'm sure will be for many in theirs. And if it's perfect timing for all of you to hear Gary Zukoff in person, go to the Mastery Conference here on October 22nd uh, in Los Angeles and to learn more thank about you. that. Felipe, can I mention uh, yes, that we have a website that we designed specifically to support people who are interested in creating authentic power or are doing it, and that is seatofthesoul.com. That's S-E-A-T, like, like what you sit on, of the S-O-U-L. And it's named after the book, The Seat of the Soul. And I'm mentioning it because there's interviews there, like this one. This one's going to be on that website. There's articles. There's videos. Uh, there's questions and answers. Uh, we answer questions uh, a lot. Uh, there's spiritual partnership guidelines that you can download for free. Everything's for free. And, uh, and practice those guidelines. So I invite you with all my heart to come visit us at seatofthesoul.com and explore it and use it, experiment with it, download the spiritual partnership guidelines, sign up for Soul Connections, our newsletter, uh, which will have more of just what you and I, Filippo, have been talking about today. And uh, it, it's just a delight to be on the show with you. We're always thinking of ways, new ways to support people. We're, we're creating an online course now that I hope will be out this year. Uh, we're, just cre we're just finishing up a lot of videos for it now. However we can support you in creating authentic power and spiritual partnership, I'd like to do that. So thank you for inviting me on your show. I'm glad that we uh, ran into each other at that conference in Los Angeles. And I'm looking forward to speaking with you or meeting you again sometime. Perhaps you'll come to the conference. Actually, I, I not only will be at the conference, but I've just been asked by the people at the Reconnection to uh, uh, to get to uh, do some of these interviews in on camera, in person for them. So we will be seeing each other at that time. I'm looking forward to it. Well, me too. Thank you, Gary, and thank you for taking the time to be with us today. You have a beautiful spiritual day. You're welcome. All right. Ciao, Gary. We'll be right back with our producer's wrap, Mark Lejour, right after this. Life Changes with Filippo is a premier radio show presented by Life Changes Network, which is a company whose team has dedicated their lives not only to positive change, but to helping others observe and embrace honor and even celebrate their own changes, thus enabling a more positive, inspired life and helping to create a more positive and inspired world. From everyday people to corporate giants, celebrities and children, we are here to help and to serve. With heart and experience, we bring our message and positive intent into your home or corporate office and even through appearances on your favorite shows. If you wish to learn more about Life Changes Life Coaching and a private consultation with one of us, corporate event appearances, or if you would like us to appear on your radio or TV shows, visit LifeChangesWithFilippo.com and click on our representation page. You are listening to Life Changes with Filippo on the BBS Radio Network with your host, Filippo Voltaggio. You can visit us online via Twitter and Facebook and at LifeChangesWithFilippo.com. That's Filippo, F-I-L-I-P-P-O. Well, we're back. I'm Filippo, and I'm here with... It's Mark. And we've been talking to Gary Zukoff about his new book, Spiritual Partnership. Mark. How timely was that information? Yeah. On so many levels. Uh, you know, this is something that you and I were just talking about, even uh, outside of, of knowing that Gary was going to be on and, and, and hearing more of the depth of of his perspective is so spot on the uh you know the the changes that we're going through and the way that we're handling them in our relationships with many people around us it's that's what i've been doing and noticing in, in in a number of 
friends and family and, and trying to check and balance my reactions to things and comparing and contrasting what I may have done in the old way of thinking versus holding myself responsible or, or not even that so much as just taking internal action and not pointing, not judging, you know, not blaming, none of that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then seeing pretty magical results, you know, unexpected results, watching change happen that, uh, that looks like you would have directly affected that person which you did, but yet in, mm. in terms of, of the way we used to know things, you know, you wouldn't have thought you did. Yes. Uh, you know, actually, that brings me for some reason to, at the beginning of the show, I talked about the shows that I was doing and, and bringing my mother up on stage, which I did at every show um, during that little tour back east in September. But you know, I, I didn't mention, and now it's coming to mind based on what you just said, that on the very last show, your mother was in the audience. And after bringing my mother up and singing to her, a couple songs later, I brought up your mother and sang a song to her. And it was interesting, though I didn't feel the same connection, like this is my mother kind of thing. There was that love there. And, and your brother was in the audience, and though I had never met him, I felt like I knew him. You know, for that moment, whether I ever see him again or not, um, there was like having a brother in the audience or a, a friend in the audience. Do, do you know what I mean? And, and, and why not? And, and maybe, maybe there's so much more than meets the eye there. And I said to you, I feel like I know him. And you said, of course you know him. He's been in my consciousness because he's your brother, yeah, how, how did, well, not only is it is he in my consciousness, but you got to think about this. We're out, right, where our family members were connected energetically, we have shared experiences. We are of you know the same lineage and cellular memory, biology. You know the the, the learning we get from our parents and ancestors and all of those things create a certain vibration. Mm. So there has to be, at a, some level, an energetic familiarity when you become close to someone to know the people that they are family with or close to, right? So, the, so, so this takes a full circle back to the outset of the conversation with Gary in multi-sensory. We're feeling more and more of that, whereas before we were so grounded in separation, we didn't know to look for or to recognize these nuances, but now, you, when you're aware of them and you start to pay attention to where familiarities may be recognized mm. and where, uh, you know, synergies or, 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 or comfort level or, or that's it, you know, right? Familiarity, uh, a knowing, uh, a kinship, you know, those things. Um, I think it's like, like the difference between when you would dial a radio station and go right to the exact station or be a little bit outside mm, of it. Mm. And I think that's the difference is we are now fine-tuning. static. Exactly. Right? We're fine-tuning, whereas before we would have to be right on in order to have a familiar, familiarity. So you would meet someone and there's someone you'd connect with. Well, of course, that was right on, right? But then you wouldn't feel... The, uh, the the further away you went from that dial, you wouldn't feel that. And I think mm -hmm. now we are starting to tune in to a, a broader spectrum and being able to fine tune uh, and, and recognizing, you know, much more closely the uh, the the lineage of the connectivity of, of that familiarity. You know, that's interesting. I, I'm almost adopting a phrase. We talked about this last night at dinner with some friends and uh, potential business partners, where we talked about how. Um, uh, Will Rogers uh, used to say he, he never met a man he didn't like. And I, I was just thinking of that phrase, especially in, in the audiences, because I'm, I'm one to, to walk about and, uh, you know, greet people, stay as long, at least at this point, stay as long as I can to say hello to people and, you know, have pictures taken and stuff like that. So anyways, um, I was thinking about this, how I'm thinking that there is, never um that that maybe there is that somebody is a friend unless proven otherwise you know kind of like guilty unless proven otherwise 
I mean, uh, innocent unless proven guilty, right? It's like we can almost look at the people that we meet because they come into our lives for a reason, and, and they may be a friend. Now, if somebody's trying to burglarize you, they're not their friend. But like he said, some of your soul mates or some of your you know soul encounters are actually people that are trying to help you on some level or so something. You're like playing that. A, a different role. You have to have racers in the race in order to win the race, right? Oh, interesting. So even though you're racing against those racers, and each one of those is your enemy. Interesting. You have to quote have... Unquote. You missed the quote-unquote because we're on radio. <laughs> but um, And we won't be on... We need to go. So um, we're, we're going to go, but we're going to continue this conversation between Mark and I and Gary and I. Um, uh, at the Mastery Conference and, I, and, and for years to come with, with you all as well. So uh, thank you all for being with us. I am Filippo Voltaggio along with our producer Mark Lejeur and Dorothy Lee Donahue. We're grateful that you're part of this world, part of this show, and part of the positive changes we all wish to see in the world. Ciao, everyone. You have been listening to Life Changes with Filippo with the Master of Change, Filippo Voltaggio. Listen live every Monday night at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on the BBS Radio Network and visit us online at lifechangeswithfilippo.com. That's Filippo, F-I-L-I-P-P-O. Today's show has been made possible in part by our sponsors, Ionways Water Systems, Change Your Water, Change Your Life, and Love and Miracles with Dorothy Lee Donahue. To learn more about them, visit the sponsor page of our website. Once again, join us here next week as we consciously explore and embrace the only constant, life changes. Life changes.